I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fang claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just sharp as they could be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. I support several other podcasts on Patreon. Um, Mm -hmm. If you're a patron, don't worry. It's from my account. It's not. We're not putting Cryptopedia funds to to fund other uh, other podcasts or anything. Mm -hmm. But one I do listen to is um, Nerd Poker. They do uh, Mm -hmm. Dungeons and Dragons. Burn Pissane. They're they're doing a uh, a Tomb of Annihilation run with like Scott Ian from Anthrax and Tom Lennon from Reno Nine One One and and all that and that's fun and they do um mm-hmm. when they read that the, the patrons have started making because they read your names lewd he-man jokes their names to get them to laugh and it's very fun and everybody likes it and i also support another podcast uh pizza mcdonald's but i also support uh boogie monster where they do listener q a and they just released a new q a episode and i'm used to hearing my name as um like kyle canane will say like oh and this one's from from brandon and he it, and he reads the question I forgot to change my name back for making the He-Man joke. So this last one, I I, I heard. Oh, looks like we've got a, a question here from uh, Orko's Prostate. <laughs> Does he even have one? I don't know. This is now. This is now. Oh boy. Oh boy, Brandon. Yeah. Brandon, stop me. Stop my Googling. <laughs> I don't know. Orcos. <laughs> I need help. <laughs> okay, it looks like I found a scholarly article about prostatic carcinogenesis. So prostate cancer. Yeah. Like. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, it looks like it's a lot of prostate cancer, is what that pulled up. Ugh. That's, oh wait, uh, did I spell it wrong? Right. <laughs> I might have spelled it wrong. Okay, Orico Prostate. Elevated PSA, 4K score test helps in prostate cancer biopsy decision. Okay. Ah, uh, interesting. Oh, also happy um happy half anniversary. That was last episode, wasn't it? Or there's 52 what? weeks in a year. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Jeez, we've been doing this for half a year. Yeah. <laughs> I like the long. The, the pod. <sighs> we've. This is the 13th episode I've done. Right? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Divided by two. And the last one was the 13th episode you've done. Yep. So this, these are two lucky episodes, apparently. Two very, um, very lucky episodes. I think I've started to lose grasp of reality. Um, this episode releases on, let's see, 14th, 18th of March. Is there yeah. anything special about the 18th of March? Oh, it's day after St. Patrick's Day, so people might be hungover. Ah, yes. Um, so I guess this is for you. Um <laughs> I'm I'm amazed that we've found 26 episodes worth of content. Yeah, oh there there's again and, the um the the other podcasts that do folklore and cryptozoology and paranormal and stuff by episode 26 it's mostly them talking about other stuff. I'm not saying that we're not talking about other stuff in the episodes, but it's like there's just full episodes of <laughs> just talking about other stuff. It's so weird. I, yeah. I, this is such a weird subject matter, is what this has taught me. Where it's really difficult to get really decent content. It um, is well the the two weeks in between because we record every other week yeah. is is at least one full week is get home from work, feed the cats, do yard work, research, go to bed, and that's for like a full week. I will. 
have a full disclosure. That's not how I do it. (laughs) I procrastinate for two full weeks. And then the night before, I stay up till 2 a.m. and write it. That's still impressive that you can get a full episode out of, uh, uh, like, one, like, pulling a later uh, uh, and and be able to get something. I have always been – I have a talent for BS. (laughs) Not lying. (laughs) Not lying. I have a talent for uh, finding enough data to fill a – to fill time. (laughs) That's that's my secret talent. If I had a superhero, it would be – He's good at writing essays. <laughs> so He's it's the probably the worst. Who... Tour. It, or the professor. Or the professor. What are you waving around in your hand? It's a toothbrush. Okay. I use it for I use it for dusting transformers. So. <laughs> because um sometimes you get a little bit of dust in them cracks. You gotta you gotta take a little toothbrush and just gently go over it. You've been watching too much of Craftsman. I actually haven't been watching that much Craftsman. There's, you just did his voice. I know he's a Craftsman. <laughs> he's a great. He has a great YouTube series. So if you've never heard of it, Google Craftsman. It's a- ASMR crafting. Well, I don't. But he's a felt human. Well, he's not a felt human. He's he- he's a human human. He's made he out of has... felt. He wears. Okay. He has. He talks as a puppet made out of felt. And when you see his real hand, he built a sleeved covers hand that's made out of felt to look like it's the puppet's hand. In some videos. In some videos. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna ru- I'm gonna launch into it this episode. Okay. Because I I think I complained. I talked about a mall story for like ten minutes last episode. <laughs> And I, I let's let's just get cut straight to the, uh, straight to the cheese. No, it's not cheese. It's something else, but it doesn't matter. Um, let's get to the so, grits. Uh, this is Cryptopedia. It's a podcast where we talk about, um, we talk about cryptids. It, paranormal stuff and you know sometimes i just rant for an hour yep <laughs> that's pretty much it um i'm john i'm brandon and yeah this is this is a weird thing so um this week's uh cryptid yes was first sighted and i'm almost 100 percent sure this is legitimately the first sighting of it uh-huh in 1893 okay its region is north america and its taxonomy is weird. I, its taxonomy is weird. I, I call it a nightmare chimera. Uh, that's interesting. Um, you might be able to guess what this week's cryptid is, though, if you follow the trajectory of my last one that I did. Okay, so I'm going to guess it's a, a fearsome critter of sorts. Yep. Uh, uh, um... North, what region of North America do we know? Wisconsin. Wisconsin. A, a weird... That's hard. Its taxonomy is weird. I'm assuming jackalope is well, further south. Yeah, it's... It's four-legged, but I... When you see the pictures, you'll, you'll understand what I mean. Oh, it God. doesn't really look like anything. Yeah. It looks like nothing. That's the problem. <laughs> oh, this is hard. I, I'm not. I don't know all my fearsome critters. I also don't know a lot about 1893 Wisconsin. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Um, I don't even have any references that I could think of. Uh, yeah, well, because this is from the. Legged. It's from the dark period of American history where you forget everything. Yeah. Um. Ah, uh, I'm really struggling. Um, uh, it has. I'll give you one more hint. It has nothing to do with Ben Kissel. It has nothing to do with Ben Kissel. So it's not a Bigfoot, is what you're telling me. Not a Bigfoot. Me. It's, it's not, not a Bigfoot. Foot. It's not a Bigfoot. It's four legged. It's Wisconsin. I'm going to guess that it is 
a uh i need more data but i don't want to ask you about the description yet you'll it, you'll know you know i know for a fact you know this fearsome critter there's literally no way that you don't know this fearsome critter it's uh it is a it's either a drunk guy in a mask or a misidentified bear but the name of the creature is the it's the Wisconsin wild man. No. Oh. No. Not even <laughs> not even close. Shoot. Like not even like a little close. Uh this week's cryptid is the hodag. It's the hodag. I should have It's the hodag. Should have guessed. Oh, well, that's why I'm like should have guessed. Uh it it's in the it's in the broadcast folder. Um, oh, okay. That's why I was kind of confused because I was like, "Oh come on, he'll get it." Because I'm doing hoop snake hodag jackalope. Because ah. it's the thing. It's the thing that we do. My whole thing is I thought you were gonna try to like, 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 like juke. I thought you were gonna juke. I thought you were gonna like, whoop, like whoop, and try to change well, it. Try to try to make me think it was a hodag, but really, it's the Wisconsin uh, wild man. So this week's no, episode uh, is on the world famous Wisconsin wild man. No, no, it's still not. I, I don't even... Is the Wisconsin wild man even a thing? Did you just... Wisconsin wild man rule 34. <laughs> I did it again! <laughs> There's a guy. There's a picture of a guy holding a fish. He's got a YouTube channel. Um. He's... There's a guy in a wild man... Okay, well, so... There is no Wisconsin wild man. Nope. There are people who claim to be a Wisconsin wild man. And this child, picture of a child for some reason. <laughs> oh, it's a Special Olympics thing. Okay. Um, anywho. So this is a continuation of episode 24? You got it. Yeah. This is a continuation of episode 24 on yes. the Cryptopedia series of Fearsome Critters. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, for those who haven't listened to episode 24, I'd recommend listening to it before listening to this episode. Because oh. we're going to make assumptions that you have uh. an understanding of what fearsome critters are yeah. and some of the notions of folklore. And mm -hmm. For the sake of people who are listening in order or listening close together, I'm not going to go over them. But for okay. a, really brief, a really brief primer or review, uh, the fearsome critters are an assortment of tall tales and local legends. Canonically, they're collected in the 1939 book by Henry H. Tyron, Fearsome Critters. The vast majority of these critters originated as lumberjack stories aggregated by this individual. Uh, this is the second in a loose series of the Fearsome Critters for Cryptopedia. And as I said before, for more details on gen the general phenomena, please consult Cryptopedia 24. Oh, yeah. Because this episode, we're going to dive straight in to the Hodak. Nice. Um, so the hodag is a little weird. Usually I like to go over like, well, what the defining traits of a creature are before I really like go into the story of it. Yeah. Um, but all the accounts that I could find differed pretty wildly. Okay. Um, so for right off the bat at the top, the first thing we see, there's the outline and then there's the um the the illustration of the hodag and this illustration appears to be the best th i would describe it as a dragon but not super yeah. big it, it's like a 15 20 foot long four-legged dragon it's got uh what appears to be two horns a spined back and no wings uh, yeah yeah it's sort of like a bull a bull he shaped head yeah they, they there's there's some like claws tail yeah, yeah sometimes people describe the head as being frog like other times something else okay um it, it's it's really difficult to pin down mm -hmm. um because it's so big yeah Can't well get a hold that of it. too that's true it's it's a slippery bastard yeah um it's, it's where they get petroleum it's it's hodag milk but it's a very strange creature and the the, yeah. the particular picture that brandon's talking about was a woodcut from uh fearsome critters mm -hmm. um which was the henry h tyron version of it uh and of course as always this is in the uh the research notes mm -hmm. that we release on our patreon it has a um, uh, interesting latin name 
associated with it. Uh, yeah. I'll say air quotes, Lighten. It's the Deformis Cor- Corniger uh, Lacrimons. Yeah, um, so if you remember from last ep- the last episode we did on Fearsome Critters, uh, Henry Tryon has a tendency of creating fake Latin names for these creatures <laughs> that don't really work as Latin. That's fantastic. Um, so uh, let's let's just uh, dive into let's it. Just let's let dive it squish. In. So I'm going to start out by reading uh, Henry Tyron's account of the Hodai. Let's see what old Henry's got to say. Reported in Maine many years past, and in 1895 captured and positively invent- identified near Rhinelander, Wisconsin, by Mr. E. S. Shepard, the Hodag is indubitably one of the best known of the larger and more dangerous wood varmints. It is now very rare, po- probably owing to the increased use of lemons in cookery, for the Hodags and citrus fruits are in the same ratio as wolves and wolf bait. Probably more so. Right off the bat, I like that we have a physical specimen. It's been captured. Mm-hmm. He also classifies it as a varmint, and that it is, is a varmint. That woodcut, I would not call that a varmint. I also <laughs> would not call it a varmint, considering it gets up to like a hundred. Like one of them was like a hundred and sixty-five, oh, another was like two thirty. Yeah, uh, they're they're heavy little little monsters <laughs> um that love citrus they invented that's where warheads uh, come no. from no actually no they hate citrus oh sorry uh, sorry wolfbane yeah yeah a single lemon will kill a hoodie oh that seems um Unhel- narrowly un- unhelpful yeah well we'll get it i i, I do get into that well, i guess that. everything is poison to cats and there's a lot of those, so I won't I won't hold that against them. Yeah, everything is poison to cats. Look at but if you're looking for house plants, all. all of them are poison, and cats all they do is chew on plants. Yes, cats are strange because they want. I I have never met a cat that has not seen something that was harmful to them and said, "Yeah, I'm not going to eat that." It's yeah. always, <laughs> "No, I'm going to eat that thing." Yeah. <laughs> Did I tell you that uh, Giro has now taken to eating bread? Oh, it's my like, cats love bread. I have to keep it in his, the fridge. It, that's what I have to do, too. It's yeah. his literal favorite thing in the world. Yeah. <laughs> and not only that, he's figured out how to open literally every door in the house with the exception of the fridge. <laughs> so my yeah. life is a nightmare. So let's see. He enjoys. We know he likes red bean. Mm-hmm. We know he likes bread bread now um did he ever get into goldfish i think he might have gotten into goldfish once. he definitely got into goldfish at one <laughs> well so here's a very fun here's a very fun story i get home the other day yeah and you know it's a late i got home late because i think i was like i think i had to go to target to pick up some stuff mm-hmm. um so i get home and i round the corner into my kitchen because my my doorway is like near the kitchen and the trash is on its side. I'm like, what? So we recently had steak, and I'm like, maybe he was like going after like maybe some of the gristle or something like yeah. that, or or maybe he was going after the like packet that the steak came in, mm-hmm. or you know, no. You know what he went for? <laughs> the single heel of bread that was thrown out. <laughs> it was the only thing that was eaten in the trash. And he destroyed the bag to get to it. <laughs> I'm increasingly convinced that this cat is a cryptid in his own right. The uh, I will say the nice thing about being... I don't eat meat at home. I eat meat when I go out, but I just don't keep meat mm-hmm. in the house. Is that yeah. I no longer really have to worry about the cats trying to eat uh, yeah. everything. Because cats don't like eggplant or cauliflower. or uh, And they're really not interested in like... The, uh, the, like, vegan version of, uh, like, chicken cutlets or anything like that. <laughs> you see, that's what you think, but the second they get a taste for it, it's like a, it's like a shark with human blood, man. <laughs> it's like a mouse with a cookie. It's like a mouse with a cookie. A cat with literally any food <laughs> ever. The second a cat realizes it can eat something, it will eat it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But this is way off the point of Hodex. <laughs> So, uh, Henry H. Tyron continues, a distressingly ugly animal, the knobbledly head wear, 
shafts, a pair of prominent bulging eyes, and two heavy lateral horns, something after the fashion of a male stag beetle. The claws are stout and powerful. The tail carries a terminal hook, while a row of jagged stegosaurian dorsal spines complete the picture. The smaller front teeth were formerly often used as umbrella handles. That, uh, I don't know. I was going to make a comment, but it's like, that seems unlikely. We're going to continue. The hodag is fully aware of its upsetting appearance. It's self-aware. Yes, and is given to frequent fits of bitter weeping. It knows <laughs> it's so ugly that it cries. <laughs> okay, this is getting less and less likely. Okay. I once had a handful of the extremely rare crystallized hodag tears, but an acquisitive lady friend collected them, believing them to be fine amber. She had them strung onto a neck yoke and then went and spilled the Tom Collins on herself. Of course, the lemon juice dissolved them instantly. Uh, I like that they crystallize as well. There's just the, he's not even tr- like, at least with the hoop snake, he was like, here's how long it is. Here's how quickly it travels. Here's how yep. poisonous it is. This one is like, it cries crystal tears and it is self-aware and sad all the time because it knows it's ugly. It's got yep. horns and spikes. Uh, the, yep. Uh, 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 this fellow cannot be in- endure being laughed at. When angry, he is fierce and dangerously aggressive, but a pair of lemons is ample protection against the whole herd. What? <laughs> so, like you were saying, in comparison to the hoop snake, uh, the Hodag Spears and Critter entry is, uh, by and large, a little bit underwhelming, but I yeah. think it's freaking hilarious. That's amazing. Um, yeah. In in Henry H. Tyron's account, the hodag is clearly a sentient creature, yeah. and it understands the notion of public ridicule and hates it. <laughs> so it's basically the opposite of a cat. Yeah. <laughs> um. At first, when I read it, it kind of almost sounds like a maldescribed dinosaur. Yeah. Um. But for the first time in the history of this podcast, it's a maldescribed dinosaur that isn't an attempt to disprove evolution. <laughs> so, hey, that's something. <laughs> um, and, and on the eighth day, he said, animals will be sad and hate lemons. <laughs> Listen, to be fair, I get that. Although then again, I love a, I love a good lemon. Lemons are good. I like them on yeah, things. Adds a little zest. Yeah. Adds a little zest. Um, also, what kind of weakness is a lemon? Is lemon juice? Like, I don't know, right? So, using them as protection implies they don't have to be ingested to be harmful. Because I could understand yeah. something con- like eating something and getting sick. But for two lemons against a whole herd, that implies you could just fling lemon juice on them or like hold it up yeah. like they're vampires and you're holding a cross i i think that this might be because with the wisconsin area uh lemons are not naturally endemic okay nor is any like real citrus fruit yeah so it might be one of those cases of yeah it's kind of hard to get lemons around here so i guess that's the thing that's weak too okay because like most of them i think are grown in california it's so. still a weird choice. It is a very strange choice. Um, but there is another thing. The like you pointed out, the usage of a hodag tooth for an umbrella handle. Yeah, handle, uh, that's pretty useful. Wow, I am burping a lot. <laughs> Something is happening to me. Um, uh-huh. that, that that might be potentially a. Not type specimen, but it might be indicative of something, maybe. At the very least, maybe someone would claim they have an authentic hodag uh, tooth umbrella handle. Oh, man. Um, I googled it. Yeah? And Is there it was a thing? nothing. Nothing? Oh, okay. Nothing. There was nothing. It was, a, it was a big old nothing burger. They um, are delicious, though. Not really. Low in calorie. They're extremely low in calorie, but that doesn't mean they're delicious. <laughs> oh, man. <sighs> I found out, okay, 
So once again, this is another non sequitur. Yeah. I found out that Taco Bell now has a mini quesadilla. What? How's it's, that work? It's pretty good. Um, basically, they give you it in a. Uh, so you know how the quesadillas work at Taco Bell, where they've got the like, like uh, the clear plastic and then yeah. the, the paper wrapping. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Don't, what they listen, do? Listen, John. My Taco Bell order is a number seven with a Baja Blast. That's a chicken quesadilla. Mm-hmm. See, mine mine's a little more complicated because I like the five layer burrito, but there's no five layer burrito number on the the menu. Yeah. So I get a five layer burrito, and then I alternate what my second taco is to be mm-hmm. either a cheesy gordita crunch, um, one of those those grillers. Like I like yeah. to get some of those grillers sometimes. Um, and now in the rotation is the mini quesadilla, which is ah. basically just a soft taco shell with quesadilla sauce and chicken in it. <laughs> and it comes in like aluminum foil and it's great because it's like it's got that like slightly z- spicy chipotle mayo sauce yeah. in it and it also has um the only problem is it does tend to explode because it's not created in this traditional way of a quesadilla yeah right um but i also also the best value at taco bell mm-hmm is whatever box they're currently selling. Oh, I believe it. Uh, if, if it has a five-layer burrito, I'm pretty much guaranteed to get it because the five-layer burrito was given to us because the universe loves us. <laughs> um, <laughs> or hates us. I'm not sure. It's one of those two things. Uh-huh. It might be hatred. But I also have an extremely firm memory of the five-layer burrito because... Yes. Because when the five layer burrito first came out, that was the same time that High Five Soup came out by the Aquabats. Okay. And I have this distinct memory of having purchased High Five Soup, <laughs> then walking to the Poughkeepsie Gallery of Food Court and eating a beefy five layer burrito while reading the liner notes oh, of man. High Five Soup. <laughs> uh, but, anyways, enough about my love. For Taco Bell. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, I love Taco Bell. Yeah. And, Inventors gosh. of diarrhea. That's Chipotle. Oh. I, I, I could eat Taco Bell and not, not poop through a keyhole. But if I eat a Chipotle, it's, it's all over. <laughs> um, ultimately, Henry H. Tyron's take on the hodag is largely lacking details. Yeah, um, the glaring exception being the range of the creature, which is kind of strange. I mean, hot, ma- Maine to Wisconsin, mm-hmm. um, and it calls out an event in 1895, which I'll get to in a minute. Okay. Um, to try and get a better picture of the hodag, though, I figured I might as well consult another fearsome creatures uh, book. Oh, this okay. time, it was written by William T. Cox in i think i yeah it was 1910 i wrote that down correct um fearsome critter creatures of the wonder <laughs> fearsome creatures of the lumber woods with a few desert and mountain beasts so it's a similar book uh it has a very similar style to the um henry tryon book mm-hmm. although it did come out before um I do prefer to use the Henry Tryon book mainly because it has the fearsome critter name. Yeah. And I think that's funnier. <laughs> that's almost a hundred percent of the reason. Uh, uh-huh. but, but, but let's get into, let's get into William T. Cox's interpretation of the Hodag, which has a different Latin name. Yeah. So the, again, the first thing at the top of this portion is a, uh, an image. Is it another wood carving or is it an illustration? It's a woodcut. Yeah. So, so this one shows, I guess, like if you would cross a hippopotamus and a zebra, what you would get. And the, uh, name of this creature is the Naso Batalis, um, histivore, Something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's a very different take on the Hodag. Oh, I, uh, it I doesn't, believe it. It doesn't even look like... If you look at the pictures, it no looks horns, nothing like a... No yeah. crazy tail, no stegosaurus spines. 
Um, this one stands up. The other one was like belly on the ground, kind mm-hmm. of four legs. This one has hooves. The other one had claws. Um, it, this very one different. looks. This one looks more like a cow mixed with a dog. In yeah. A sense. It, it's really it's it's hard to describe. Uh, links are in the show notes. All that good stuff. So. This animal has been variously described by woodsmen from Wisconsin and Minnesota. Opinions differ greatly as to the appearance of this beast. Some claiming to be, to be covered with horns and spines and having a maniacal dis- disposition. So that's basically the uh, Henry H. Tryron version. Yeah. Right. The description which seems most authentic and from which the sketch of the animal has been made is as follows. Size about that of an a rhinoceros and somewhat resembling an animal in general makeup. The creature is slow in motion, deliberate, and unlike the rhinoceros, very intelligent. Man, way to dunk on rhinoceros. Yeah. Jeez, Louise. Like, I mean, on in Beast Wars, the rhino was the most intelligent member of the team. Rhinox was the best. He's still the best. Rhinox number one. All right, we're moving on. Uh, its hairless body is molted and in- <laughs> modeled and striped and checkered in a striking manner suggested of the origin of the patterns upon Mackinac clothing now used in the lumber woods so kind of like the uh the the what you call it what's it called uh pants the, no Mackinac clothing that's like uh uh what's the word what's the word it's flannel like a flannel uh, shirt i got gotcha. it's like it's like a flannel uh yeah lumber, flannel pattern lumber jackie yeah, because yeah. you always pick, picture lumberjacks in, uh, in flannel. flannel. Yeah. So if you're imagining this, imagine a rhino covered in flannel. There you go. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, on the hodag's nose, instead of a horn, there is a large spade-shaped bony growth with particular phalanges extending and up in front of the eye so that he can only see straight up. That doesn't seem helpful to anything. Nope. Uh, this probably accounts for the deliberate disposition of the animal, which wanders through the spruce woods looking for suitable food. About the only living creature which the hodag can catch is the porcupine. Okay. Indeed, it would appear that the porcupine is its natural food. Upon sighting one rolled up in the... I don't know. Do porcupines climb trees? Yes, they actually do. Ah, okay. That is a thing. That is a thing. Porcupines do climb trees. Okay, I only know it from like uh, in like old westerns, like they're like all oh, the dogs got the porcupine quills in the nose, and then they gotta get the quills out. Um, porcupine quills will destroy a dog, by the way. I believe they're it. not. Oh, oh, there's a brave wilderness video about it. Ah, okay. Oh yeah, I saw that one. He um, he basically slaps a porcupine. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at it right now. Like he doesn't slap oh, he's, slap it, but he like lets it. He's get teaching, him. he's teaching people how to uh, remove the needles. Yeah, that. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh boy, that looks painful. Also, the porcupine's just chilling next to him after it, it quills him. Uh, yeah, he puts his body through a lot of stuff to, to like teach people. Like, there's one where he he lets. What's the name of the really big snapping turtle? He lets one bite his arm to show you the kind of damage it'll do to your arm. An alligator snapping turtle? Yeah, he, an alligator snapping turtle. So he lets one bite him. And then he also How? does the whole uh, insect pain sting index, which is amazing. Brave Wilderness. I, Coyote I Pearson. Get, I get worried for him. Yeah, I think it's a sexual thing at this point. Oh, God. Every time. Every time we mention yeah. Coyote Peterson, we talk about his fetishes. Well, the last time we talked about him, I don't think we actually said what it was. <laughs> we were just talking about someone saying, look at me, <laughs> like getting stung. Yeah, that's, that's fair. <laughs> um, so back to the hodag again. Uh, upon sighting one rolled up in the branches of a spruce, the hodag begins to blink his eyes, lick his chops, and spade around the roots and over goes the tree. He literally overturns trees. Yes, to eat 
porcupines. And if you actually look at the woodcut, you can see him doing it in action. Yeah, here's the uh, thing. It, if it's a made-up yep. thing, why mm -hmm. not just give it the ability to climb a tree? That's a good question. I actually have a theory for that. So, therefore, it must be true. So, my theory... Okay. My theory is yeah. that this iteration of the Hodag is an explanation for why trees randomly fall in the forest. Oh, that makes sense then. Yeah. Yep. I think I think it's a uh, a folklore tale that makes a mundane event into something interesting. If a tree falls in the woods, did a Hodag do it? Yes, the answer is correct. Yeah. Yes, it is. As long as there's porcupines in them, there woods. As long as there's porcupines in them, there woods. Um... So as it happens, the the porcupine loses, gets the breath knocked out of it from the fall, and then the hodag straddles the fall, fallen tree, uh, and its front feet crush the helpless porcupine. What? That thing's brutal. Then it deliberately swallows the the porcupine head first. Oh, well that makes sense because if the quills are pointing towards Backwards. the back, then yeah. that would help in digestion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the final paragraph of this particular document is, uh, in the autumn, the hodag strips the bark off a number of spruce or pine trees and covers himself all over with pitch. He then searches out a patch of hardwood timber where dead leaves lie thick on the ground. Here he rolls about until completely encased in a thick, warm mantle of leaves in which condition he spends the winter. That's fantastic. That's, I didn't yeah. picture it as like a coat for for sleeping. I pictured it as like, because it's intelligent. So the hodag's like, I'm gonna go stealth on these bitches, and then it just rolls in the leaves, and like so is stalking sky porcupines. You're imagining a ghillie suited, yeah, a hundred percent, like a rhino in a ghillie suit. Great, that'd be pretty. <laughs> oh, oh no, that's a, that's good, a good one. That's yeah. a good image. That's a good good image. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, a ghillie suited rhino. Yeah, like pine needle. Well, at first I thought you was you were gonna say pine needles, so it could trick the porcupines into thinking like it's a porcupine. Hello, fellow porcupines. It is I, <laughs> porcupine. Is Steve Buscemi a uh uh is he a, is he a hodag? He's a so hodag. For kids, for He's teenagers, a hodag that. Got covered in pitch and rolled in human flesh. That's why. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. You, you forever mod mo you forever ruined my perception of, of uh, Steve Buscemi. Yeah, I met him once. He came into where I used to work before be the job before my last job. <laughs> Well, he came into the place where celebrities routinely came into. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is basically what I was hoping for. I wanted behavioral details. Yeah. Uh, it's more air quotes believable. Uh huh. Uh, and it paints a picture of a bizarre, but somewhat believable animal in that there's nothing particularly outlandish about anything it does. Just other than super the, the impractical rhinoceros that rolls in pitch and topples trees to eat porcupines, well, but also hates lemons. It, well, he, this this didn't mention anything about lemons. Uh, true. All the all the like fantastical stuff is not mentioned in this. Gotcha. Um, however, its morphology not great. Uh, not great. It, its eyes. Are, being forced to look up would be both a navigational and a survival issue. Um, Cause keep in mind in this region, wolves are apex predators. Yeah. It's also a hairless hooved creature, which, and I, I might be wrong and might think of an example as soon as I say this, but we don't have those in the U S mm, especially correct. in Wisconsin. Is there anything up North? I think no. every large mammal is is covered in fur especially in yeah that we have it up up north yeah no yeah. so it's it's not a uh whether it be short like a cow or whether it be long like um like the closest yeah the closest thing that i can think of would be like an okapi mm -hmm. but that still has fur so yeah um 
which is the, probably the closest thing that this is described as. But mm -hmm. regardless, um, it is possible that it has a de-emphasized sight, but I think, I, I as I'm writing all this out, I realized I was overthinking the hodag. <laughs> <laughs> So I stopped trying to explain it and just rolled with it. Yeah. Um, there are only two two clear points, though, that are shared between the two stories. Yeah. Uh, it's a Midwest cryptid. And it's intelligent, if not sentient. Yeah. I, I just is... want you to know that mm -hmm. right now you are making Henry Tryon the happiest man not alive. Because little did he know, in 126 years, two people would still be talking about his hodag using, for all intents and purposes, magic to throw their voices across the world and tell other people about it. You're not wrong. But <laughs> also, <laughs> yeah. you are kind of wrong because it's not his hodag. Well, his using his source material, which I assume the way it's written was intended to make people go, no shit. They have that in Wisconsin. <laughs> it was, it was definitely a, Hey, we got this yeah. wink, wink. <laughs> um, but, but, but the link, the weakness to lemons, yes. the crystallization of its tears and general morphology are all points of contention between these two stories. So, so, Let's take a trip to Wisconsin. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I'm gonna go pick you up. All right. All right. I got yeah. I got gas in my car, so. Okay. Let's, I'll yeah. uh, if we need to stop, I'll, I'll I'll cover the gas on the way there. Well, it's Wisconsin, so we're gonna probably have to to shift off on gas. True. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, let, let's 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 not be animals here. We can yeah. share. We can share the 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 cost. Yeah. <laughs> so, Rhinelander, 1895, according to Henry H. Tyron. Okay. But it's actually 1893. Uh, okay. The, the, story, the story that he was re referring to took place in 1893. Yeah. So, Eugene Shepard, a land surveyor, timber cruiser, and general prankster. Do you want me to describe the picture before or after you read this part? Because it's amazing. Uh, let me read this part and then you can describe it. Okay. Uh, he was walking in the woods on a fateful night in 1893 uh -huh. and he smelt an unusual odor. Investigating the smell, he discovered the first canonical instance of the creature we've been describing in this episode. In uh. The Hodag and Other Tales of Logging Camps, 1928, Lakeshore Kearney recounts, recounts the events offering yet another description of the hodag. This so, is amazing. I'm yeah, you can describe happy. the picture. Okay. Imagine if you will the woods, the American mm -hmm. North. It's uh there's no snow, so it's just normal foliage. But in in that foliage there's a man laying on his back uh near a log. Standing over him is Someone's interpretation. This is a photograph, by the way. This is not a, not a, a wood carving. A guy laying on the ground. We've got what I assume someone took, ta like taxidermy a badger and put a horn on it and drew a mouth on it. And then around that is a group of possibly fifteen to twenty-five. Um, I'm not like villagers. I'm saying they're not woodsmen. Um, yeah. They have pitchforks and axes. My favorite is the guy dead center with a vest, white shirt, and a bowler cap who looks like he's just going to punch it. <laughs> yeah, so he does look like he's just going to punch it. It's so good. And they're clearly uh, not all posing. They're not. No, <laughs> no they are that, not. On the bottom right, there's also a guy with a long rifle. Lower right-hand corner, crouching it's... down. He's going to shoot it right in the... He's aiming below the anus. He's going to shoot the hodag in the balls at, like, yes. point-blank range. Yes, Look at those mutton a... chops. Some formidable mustaches on these folks as well. There's also a young boy next to him, just to his left. <laughs> Wait, there's a young boy? I don't see the young boy. Do you see the guy with the gun yeah. that's crouching down? The first person to his left 
that isn't the oh guy. Oh God, it is a child. <laughs> that is a child. <laughs> and then see the guy that's in the middle that's going to punch the hodag. Yeah. Just over his right shoulder, your left. Oh, there's left. another child. <laughs> wow. I did, not, I did not examine this photo at all. So I have no idea what this photo is from. I don't know. It's fantastic, though. Uh, I just found it on, like, an article about this story. Yeah. And I added it to the, the copy. Um, yeah. Because it's a great picture. It's so good. I, I think that this was taken in more modern times with a filter, but I could be wrong. It's possible. Um, they did good if it's a... But it, it's definitely what? not from the 1800s, that's for sure. No. Not even the late 1800s. So, regardless, let's uh, let's let's get into Lakeshore Kearney's interpretation and recounting of this tale. Though a student of wood lore and of both prehistoric and other wild animals, Mister Shepherd could not classify the monstrosity which he was gaze- was gazing at him with glowing green eyes and sniffling from nostrils of flaming hue. The animal's back resembled that of a dinosaur and his tail, which extended to an enormous length, had a spear-like end. Sharp spines, one and a half feet apart, lined the spinal column. The legs were short and massive, and the claws were thick and curved, denoting great strength, because claws indicate your strength. Um, yeah. Although, the, I guess I guess the length, the legs being short and massive was the indication, but... Um, the broad, furrowed forehead was covered with coarse, shaggy hair, and bore two large horns. From the broad, muscular mouth, sharp, glistening white teeth protruded. The strange animal of the woods had an alert movement, and the swish of his tail made the earth tremble. When he exhaled, an obnoxious odor penetrated the atmosphere for some distance. That is closer to the first description that we've heard yeah. so far. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's much closer to Henry Tryon's version of the story. But so far, um, nothing says how big it is i mean the second description um made rhinoceros like but but everything else seems to be avoiding saying it's approximate size i I think i think that's deliberate okay um i think it's deliberate that they don't say the size because like if you look at the picture it's like like a small dog yeah like a medium-sized dog maybe Mm mm-hmm um, but they, if you look at, like, yeah, they might be using some authors do this, and um, I, it's hit or miss depending on how they do it. Where there will be a main character which they don't really describe too well, mm-hmm. um, and, and I think the intent is that it lets you assign your own characteristics to it or make you identify with the character more by assigning your own characteristics with it. So they might be doing that intentionally. So you can make it for yourself as large or small or modify in your mind, the aspects of the creature to whatever you like best. That um, might be very likely yeah. because the, the way that the story takes, it grows legs in the modern era. Um, yeah. I think one of the becomes... authors that does it best is um, uh, Patrick Rothfuss. Um, writes uh, the King Killer uh, yeah. Chronicles quote, uh, which is has a TV show and movie in the works, but the only thing they ever tell you about the main character is the color of his hair. Outside of huh. that, there is no description, and it's one of the best books. I still have to read King Killer. It's so good. If you like it's high on fantasy, my list. yeah, it's on my list. Uh, let me let me know if you want my Audible info. <laughs> No, I I, li- I actually prefer reading. Okay, to, to I've also books. got physical copies of the books. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll probably get around to it eventually. I have so many books that are on my queue to read right now. That it's <laughs> I still have to read the the three body problem. And three body stuff. problem was so good. So there's a I got I got some stories I need to read. Um, did I tell you that um, three body problem? Is the author writing about living in communist China, but through the lens of a sci-fi uh, novel? Yes, I think you okay. told me that. Yeah, because it's it's a translation from Chinese to English. That's right. Yeah, I now remember you telling me this. Mm-hmm. Um, but back to the hodag. 
Books are good. Uh, back to the hodag. Mm -hmm. uh, you could make the argument that this is a more verbose take on the fearsome critter iteration of the hodag. Okay. Um, or rather, the fearsome critter iteration is a less verbose version of this. Yeah. Because this came out before the fearsome critter book was written. Mm -hmm. um, in this retelling of the story, uh, they do note the foul breath of the hodag, which is actually pretty prominent in some of the more modern things that I've seen. Okay. Um, now, after he finds the creature, mm -hmm. Shepard decides he needs to capture it. And, you know, I like type specimens, so yeah, yeah. let's do this. Um, the text that follows is some of my favorite description and, like, setup that I've ever read in my life. And I was yeah. originally going to summarize it, but I left it intact because it's so good. Oh, nice. Ruminating on a plan by which he might capture this animal, he hastened to the nearby village and disclosed his startling information to the Ancient Order of the Reviting Society. Uh, I'm just gonna uh, say it. You, there's you can't have an ancient order in the U.S. <laughs> not really. Um, I did some research, and all hits return to this book. Oh, okay. They might be a secret society, but if they are, they make the Bo Bohemian Grove look like it's public. No. <laughs> so, uh, in the in the ancient tent of this mysterious order of the Reviting Society, behind the closed flap, he related his experience to those great, world-renowned men, selected from the farthest corners of the earth, men of great courage and chivalry. They were men who, in the rough-and-tumble fight with a bear, would toss their guns to the brush, stick their bowie knives into the nearby tree, and give the, <laughs> the big brune both underholts in their desire not to take advantage of the beast. This was the type of men he selected to help him capture this formidable nondescript. <laughs> I That's love good. this description. I love this idea of like this man's man society that's so so powerful that they freaking Liam Neeson it. They I, I feel like they're like, oh, this isn't a fair fight and just ditch all their weapons. Also, that they didn't Liam Neeson it because Liam Neeson never fought a wolf in that movie. I yeah, watched he... that whole movie because I'm like, I want to see Liam Neeson's punch a wolf. And you know how that movie ends? You know how that movie ends? Cut he black. puts cut glass, wraps it around his hand, and then there, it cuts to a wolf looking intense. Liam Neeson looking intense. He pulls back his fist like he's going to punch the wolf, and it cuts to fucking black. I watched that whole movie. <laughs> I watched that whole movie because I want to see Liam Neeson's punch a wolf, and he never did it. So, uh, this, this, um, this particular bit of this particular bit of um, the whole movie, Brandon Moore. The whole movie was pitched about you get to see Liam Neeson punch a wolf. Uh, so this this particular bit of Brandon lore has, I would call this the first thing that you got very upset at to me. <laughs> um, and this, I think, of all your bet movie betrayals in your life, I think, outside in, this is probably the <laughs> one that you have the have the most um, problem with. Yeah, yeah. Because it was the watch Liam Neeson punch a wolf movie, and it never happens. Well, it happens, just off screen. Then it didn't happen. Hmm. No, it happened. Don't worry. That That's like if A New Hope, like, it opens, then it cuts to black, and then episode five comes out, and it just says, there's the opening scroll, and then an ellipses, and then it just says, we, they did it. And then that's it. Yeah. That's good. <sighs> That's a new type of storytelling. Uh, uh, uh. After picking the A-team of lumberjacks, Shepard then makes an attempt to determine the taxonomic group of the Hodag. However, it is largely nonsense. 
as such, let's jump a, let's jump ahead to the good bit. It's kind of <laughs> like reading uh, it's kind of like reading Moby Dick, you know, when you get to the cetology chapters, just skip those. Yeah. <laughs> Shepard <sighs> ordered a crew of men to dig the, a large pit several miles from the point where he had first sighted the animal. This huge excavation, which was 50 feet in diameter and 30 feet deep. That's an achievement. Yes. Was yeah. covered with poles thrown across the opening. They, I mean, 30 they, didn't feet. Have car, they didn't have cartoons yet, did they? No. <laughs> it, it was 50 feet in diameter. That's yeah. huge. Yeah. Uh, the trap was successfully hidden by limbs and grass ca- laid carefully across the poles. So at this point, uh, Mr. Shepard is channeling uh, Fred with his plan. Yeah. Like, without a doubt. Yeah. And as I was reading, I was half expecting the Hodag to become Old Man Jenkins. Yeah. Um, because this is the most bizarre way to try and catch a creature ever. Because not only that, 50 feet is way too big. Yeah, so, so just... Just as a heads up, that's 29,452.43 cubic feet of dirt. 20,000, you said? 29,000. Okay, so like 30,000. That's a lot of dirt to catch one creature. Here's the other thing. A a cubic foot of dirt weighs about 10 pounds, which means they (laughs) dug so much. So like three hundred thousand pounds of dirt. Uh, for yeah, yeah, for the sake of easy math, yeah. Jesus. Fifteen well, tons. Well pleased with his strategy, Mister Shepard selected a man from the North Woods to help with the daring adventure of catching the Hodag. A young man of marathon fame, so apparently he was in a bungee game, um, <laughs> and a noted ski jumper with many honors and medals, was considered to be the person most capable of engaging the exploit. By request, his name is not mentioned because modesty as well as bravery was one of his outstanding characteristics. Of course it was. Of course it was. Why not? Why not? It's definitely there. That anonymous hero is definitely a real thing. There's no chance that it's not. Regardless, this unnamed hero then leads an ox through the woods to entice the hodag and capture it in the trap. So it's definitely not Paul Bunyan. No. Okay. Not. So when he encounters the Hodag, it lets out a growl so deep, loud, and sepulchral <laughs> that it fairly shook the earth, causing a vibration so great that it started a great shower of leaves and wind- limbs from the trees. Squaw! I believe it was, I'm a ho- <laughs> yeah, I'm a hodag. Hey. Oh. Don't laugh at me. <laughs> uh, the plan ultimately works, and the hodag is trapped in the 50 foot wide pit. Oh. Um, it, a, as a reward, the hero gets a good bed and plenty to eat. Of course, he does. Now. Before it abruptly ends the story, the author makes sure to affirm the masculinity of one of the architects of the plan. And actually, all of the architects of the plan, for that matter. Uh Uh-huh. The men who had planned this hazardous feat knew to a certainty that there were no sloping foreheads or receding chins in their group. Huh? (laughs) They're basically... So, sloping foreheads and receding chins is like a nobility thing, and it's like being an idiot because yeah. like what's his name uh that one spanish king king charles the second i want to say i believe it was joffrey son of cersei yeah uh that's some spoilers right there uh there is it basically spoilers? they're not oh yeah no there it is no it's it, not it, it's, not spoilers it's, it's episode it's one spoilers it, regardless uh <sighs> basically they're saying they're not inbred morons yeah. Um, yeah. They they lost no time in going to the private tent to confer with that mysterious man, Arthur Coenzer, which is the first time he's mentioned in the story. A brother in good standing in their order of the Reveting Society. This man with protruding forehead, 
known as a mastermind. He can never be accused of being so effeminate as to have pink lace on his underwear. Why? Quickly, Why? Okay, so there's a, uh, a just some rando who goes unnamed, but the guy in the secret society goes, oh yeah, uh, just go ahead and publish that in, in print though. Just put my name in print because I'm in the yeah. secret society. Yeah. Uh, one second. Look how big my forehead is. Apparently this guy, I forgot to look him up because I wasn't thinking. He's like a real, there's a real Arthur Coenser from that time period, but uh, I'm not going to do the research right now because mm. I legitimately don't believe that it has any bearing on the story. Um, yeah. But he also, also, it's really strange that they're like calling out his masculinity in that way and like saying he's a man's man. Although I will note that it wasn't until uh, recently that pink became a, a girl's color. Yeah. Um, and this book was in fact public, but I was like, as soon as I read that, I was nervous that I was well, reading a book that was like published after the fact. It used to be that little boys and girls, it, it, there was not gendered clothing. Be, yeah. They would wear dress. There you could see Teddy Roosevelt as a little boy in a dress. Cause that's just how yeah. it was then. Yeah. But I, I think it was more focused on the lace than anything else. Cause I did verify this. Yeah. There is a physical book that has a publication date of 1928. And this was not just, some internet thing I found. Okay. So, yeah. Um, but le- finishing the, the little bit quickly pointed out a way in which Mr. Shepard could exhibit his recently acquired animal with safety. Um, but that's not the end of the story. It's the end of the story in the book. Yeah. They mentioned like the hodag laying eggs in the book, which was weird. Uh-huh. Um, and said that they would cover it later, but they don't. So, I don't know. This story is really freaking hard to pin down. Yeah. Because it's like a bunch of non-specific details. Mm-hmm. Which is always great for Wikipedia when you're trying to research something. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, I did look to see if I could find a newspaper article for it. Okay. And in a weirdly surprising case, I was able to find a newspaper article for this. What? Yes. It was in the New North, October 28th edition from 1893. Um, It's a local newspaper in Rhinelander, Wisconsin. I'm not sure if it was a satire or not, because it says, like, if you look at the article, it says it's from the snake editor or... It says by the snake editor or by the shake editor. I couldn't read it because it's like, um, it, it looks like it's by the snake editor. So maybe it's like a, mm. a joke section of the, of the, uh, newspaper. I have yeah. no idea. Um, there's no mention of Mr. Shepard made in this this article. Okay, um, but it purports that the Kodag was not killable by conventional firearms. And only dynamite was successfully capable of killing the hot They should have tried a lemon. They should have, but apparently the lemon wasn't in the lexicon at this point. Um, the article also claims that the hot was on display after being killed. Oh, and um, they had photography. Which actually, I found another article that says they took a picture of the dead hot Ah, and said picture is still available. I couldn't find it, but I don't know if that means that I was being lazy and it was 1 a.m. when I was writing this, or <laughs> oh, no. if I legitimately can't find it. Oh. Um, but I looked for a little more information, and I yeah. found a 2004 article written by Holly Hilgenberg, Hilgenberg about the Hodag. In this account, the Hodag is said to have only eaten white bulldogs on Sundays. Like ice cream. Mm-hmm. Um, incidentally, the original Hodag, which was killed by dynamite, was not the only Hodag found by Shepard. In fact, he found one three years later in 1896. Oh, how fortuitous. Um, And he was able to catch this one alive, and some accounts imply it was through the use of chloroform, which is the third weakness of the Hodag. 
That's fantastic. I would love to see that. This is a guy sneaking up on a hodag. It's covered in leaves and in 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 pine resin, and he's yeah. got just like a bath towel <laughs> covered in chloroform. Yeah. <laughs> And he, um, I'm assuming, is immune to chloroform. The hodag? No, the guy. Well, yeah, because he's a strong man. Yeah, look at it. Obviously. Look at his chin and the lack of lace. Mm-hmm. That's how you know. And his forehead. It's protruded. Yeah. Like a Cro-Magnon. Um, <laughs> this hodag would then make the, sh- the rounds of both Shepherd's Home in the first Oneida County Fair as a sideshow. In this sideshow, the hodag even moved and growled. Ah. However, it turns out that this hodag was carved from wood and bullhorns and puppeted by Shepard's son, um, which Shepard admitted to once the Sasonian sent scientists to investigate. The uh, I just I don't know I still love sideshow gaffs. Yeah, so it basically the whole thing uh, was a myth, was a myth created by the like town council. To drive up tourism in a lumber uh, town, and the and Eugene Shepard was basically the guy who uh, who was responsible for it because he was a known prankster. And like I think I read another story <laughs> where he um, he basically got wood fish and made it look yeah. like there were fish in the in the lake to get people to stay longer, so he could like sell stuff to them. Uh, I like the cut of this guy's jib. <laughs> Yeah, he's like a, a total prankster, total like shyster type. Yeah. And it's pretty great. Um I also I think and I'm not sure that might be the the picture down there in the mm. the, the copy of yeah. the hodag. That might be the wood and uh ox hodag from the picture before. If you uh. look at that picture and then look at the picture above. I'm yeah. pretty sure that that's either a reproduction or the hodag in that picture. I gotcha. Um, also, another fun note, uh, the article that I found discussing him puppeting Shep- uh, Shepherd's son, puppeting the hodag, yes. was written by uh, Carrie Poppy of uh, Oneida ah! Rocks and Carrie. Yeah. Right on. I realized that after I had already written everything. I'm like, yeah. oh, it's Carrie Poppy. Yeah. Oh, hey, how about that? Because I... I used some of her sources to augment my sources that I found. So. Yeah, no, she, she. I trust her sources. She. She. Yeah, she's she's an actual journalist, yeah. as opposed to <laughs> me, who's a. Uh, for my fun, I read articles about cryptids and then talk about them for an hour. Yeah, on the internet. Um. So yeah. <laughs> now, the modern hodag is what. Yeah. Oh, so, I believe it. Uh, if you scroll down in the copy, and I, I'll have a link to the Chamber of Ch- Commerce site, which has a picture of this statue. It's fantastic. There's a phenomenal statue of a hodag that lives in front of the Chamber of Common- Commerce of Rhinelander, Wisconsin. It looks like it might be a painted wood carving. It is. It's gorgeous. It, it's, it's big, too. Yeah. That thing's it makes, pretty big. It makes our, our, uh, our gnome look like nothing. Yeah. Um, so the Hodag now has officially licensed products, which you can see on the Rhinelander site. Okay. Uh, a series of art statues similar to what Catskill or Port Ewan has. Yeah. Um, where, you know, like each ar- there's like an artist who gets a statue and then they set it up around town, which yeah. there's actually a thing for finding uh, the statues around town. Um, it has a collection of video games on the Rhinelander site. Fantastic. Uh, there's a music festival, and it's the uh, the mascot of the local high school. Um, <laughs> the official description of the hodag is covered in green, fine green fur, height 30 inches, weight 185 to 275 pounds, length 7 feet. Diet, reports very widely, mud turtles and water snakes, oxens, white bulldogs eaten only on Sundays. Reported to have the head of a frog, the face of an elephant, Stout legs, a spiky dinosaur-like back, and a long tail. Smell is a combination of buzzard meat and skunk perfume. I wouldn't call it perfume, but okay. <laughs> um, basically, the long and short of it is the hodag 
has come to represent the town of Rhinelander. It's basically its birthplace, as far as I can tell. Yeah. Um, yeah. Based on my readings, I was unable to find anyone who truly believed in the existence of the Hodag. However, it seems to be an ascended prank where okay. everyone kind of carries it on in a spirit of good fun, and yeah. the Chamber of Commerce carries it on in the spirit of good capital. Um, but yeah, so the Hodag is something for sure. It's um, definitely something. It, it doesn't have as storied and long of a history as the Hoop Snake. Yeah, but it does have a lot of. It, it's definitely a slice of Americana for sure. Uh huh. Because the number of things in America that start with someone making a prank about something, yeah, is frankly upsetting. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah. yeah, so that's all I have to say about the Hodag this week. <laughs> um, yeah, I really honestly, I honestly don't know what else to say about the Hodag. Because it's like, it's such a wild, non entity type yeah. story like it's clearly a joke like <laughs> there's no reality in which is th- this is not a t- tall tale no i uh, i like it it's just a fun it's just a fun thing now honey dipper dan now honey dipper dan Ugh. i feel bad for honey dipper dan after i had to use an outhouse <laughs> Oh, did I tell you, I I might have said this before, they're doing renovations on the bathrooms at work, so for Mm -hmm. one of the plants, they put uh, some outhouses outside, but this is earlier in the year, where it was... You didn't tell me about that. No, okay, so they put outhouses outside, but my concern was that if it's, if it's like negative, you know, eight or whatever outside, what happens if you get... If you have a code brown and you get froze out, like if the doors get frozen shut on the outhouses, and then you've got to run all the way over to one of the other plants. Rest in pieces is what that means. You get frozen in the loo, unless they're like heated them somehow, but then in that case, we've got to deal with heated, a heated nope. outhouse. No, nope, It's just I'm, all kinds of bad. I'm calling an audible. I'm calling yeah. an audible. The podcast has ended. It's over. <laughs> We're done. Oh. See, you made transmutate fall. <laughs> made her die again. Say, so, hasn't transmutate again. fallen? She's dead. Um, so, as always, if you want to get in contact with us, and we're going to ignore the fact that you just talked about a heated outhouse. Yeah. Uh, the website is cryptopediacast.com. Our Instagram and Twitter are at cryptopediacast. You can email us at cryptopediacast at gmail.com or us at cryptopediacast. Uh, we've got a Patreon. There's stuff mm-hmm. on there. Um, we've got a Facebook group, which you can join. Uh, just search Cryptopedia. I think if you just search Cryptopedia, you can find it. Uh, yeah. Just search Cryptopedia and you can find yep. it. Um, it's a closed group, so you can post all the weird shit in there you want, and mm-hmm. uh, your friends and coworkers don't have to know about it. <laughs> It was deliberate. Uh, <laughs> if you enjoy the show, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, all that good stuff. Um, I did just recently get like a weird email. I forgot to mention this on last episode. Mm-hmm. I guess iTunes is changing stuff about okay. metadata. So there is a chance that we might disappear from the iTunes feed for a little while. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I'm keeping an eye on the situation, but we're still good so far. They gotcha. they made a bunch of like really weird like don't put don't put number episode numbers in your video names don't put metadata tags in your titles yada 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 but like for our podcast I I kind of don't want to cut the episode number out and yeah. I also don't want to cut the metadata information out of the title because it kind of our yeah. our podcast is a little weird because it's hard to. Uh, we 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 name the episode after something like a joke in the yeah. podcast. So, and we also deliberately don't name it after the cryptid, which is the thing we decided on early on. So, yeah. but regardless, uh, we'll just keep an eye on that. And if things go wrong, we'll try to fix it as quickly as we can. Mm-hmm. Um, 
If you have any monster requests or stories, Creepypasta, Cryptopasta, send them our way. Eventually, I'll read Creepypasta again. <laughs> uh, and if you would like, you could find me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb.com. My email is brandon at boyer, sorry, is brandon at cryptopediacast.com. And my Twitter is at crypto brandon. Uh, if you want to get in contact with me on Instagram, I'm at Mew2057. On Twitter, at JF Dunham. Hopefully, my website's resurrected at this point because I actually have been working on it. Oh, um, nice. My email is john at cryptopediacast.com, and that's all I have about that. Our art was done by Tom Hill. You could find him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatergloryco.com, and his email is tommikehill at gmail.com. I'm about to start yawning, John. I'm Brandon. And things are going to get weird. Weird.